thanks for uh, joining us in downtown Barrie today. Um, my official first function is to introduce uh, the lady that's going to introduce our former governor, Marion Milne. Uh, I've known Marion for a few years. <laughs> Hopefully I uh, feel like I've got a lot in common with her. And I uh, want to thank you for uh, coming out and uh, supporting our efforts, Mom. And uh, look forward to uh, having some good comments with all of you. Hopefully people can come on across the street with us and enjoy a burger. I made sure the Elks have uh, veggie burgers on the menu there as well for folks that are watching cholesterol and things. So uh, we're going to have a good time here for a few minutes. And uh, I'll get around to formally thanking and introducing people in a minute. But uh, Mary and Mill, come on up. I know if he was elected, he would be as good a governor as he is a son to both of us. And uh, it's my great privilege, I don't know why, but to introduce our honorable former governor, Jim Douglas. Thank you, Jim. You know the old saying that the uh, importance of the introduction is inversely proportional to its length. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very grateful. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here with uh, you and Scott and other members of your family this morning and your hometown, uh, a facility that served this community so well for so long. Dorothy and I remember uh, uh, coming to a, a number of uh, galas here through the years to help support the Aldrich Library and, and I'm delighted to be here with all of you today. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, recognize another Barry boy, uh, Lieutenant Governor Phil Scott, who's with us. <laughs> Two Scots from Barry. It's going to be easy for people to remember when they go to the voting booth. Well, this is uh, an auspicious day for Vermont, and I'm privileged to be a part of it. Scott will, uh, in just a few moments, formally offer his services to the people of our great state. He'll uh, provide an opportunity for some solid, experienced, and sensible leadership for Vermont over the next couple of years. He understands the magnitude of the task, but I think we've seen very clearly over the recent past that the size of a war chest doesn't necessarily mean the outcome of the race. I have just two words, Eric Cantor. <laughs> so, things are changing. And I think uh, uh, Scott's going to be able to take advantage of that tremendous opportunity. It's a challenging time for our state. We're still struggling to recover from the Great Recession and facing some headwinds as we do so. We're a state that's known widely for a high tax burden and for onerous set of regulations. There was a recent survey of states' uh, friendliness to small business. Perhaps you saw it in the media recently. And Vermont once again ranked very near the bottom of that list. Our workforce is shrinking. It's down by 8,500 since the time I left office. And just last month, another 900 Vermonters joined the ranks of the unemployed. A low unemployment rate doesn't really matter much if the numerator and denominator are both shrinking. We've got some serious problems in our workforce, and we need leadership to address them. We have what's called net domestic out-migration. It's a mouthful, but what it means is more folks are moving out of Vermont to other states in our country than are moving in. And that's not a formula for prosperity or economic success. We need to build that workforce by keeping more young Vermonters here and by attracting others who share our values and who would like the opportunity to live in the Green Mountain State. Our school population is declining, but our property taxes keep going up. A few years ago, I presented to the legislature a chart that showed that for every 100 fewer students we have in our schools, we hired 12 more employees. That's not a successful formula for fiscal responsibility or lowering the tax burden of our state either. We have a crisis of affordability in Vermont. Housing is expensive here, health care costs are high, higher education is beyond the reach of many of our families, and the tax burden continues to grow. We recently had a health care exchange rollout. Perhaps you heard about that. Didn't go so well. It was a sort of combination of 
incompetence and confusion, I guess, but um, they're, they're going to try for more. They want to shift a sixth of our state and national economy into a, an untested, single-payer, state-run, government-financed scheme. We don't know how it'll work. We don't know how much it'll cost. We don't know how we're going to fund it. Other than that, sounds like a great idea. <laughs> We need leadership to offer sensible solutions that reduce costs, expand access to care, and maintain the high quality that we enjoy in the outstanding medical community in our state. Remember that we have the second lowest uninsured rate in America. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's make the kinds of changes that are necessary to include everyone at an affordable rate, but, but not throw the system on its head. Well, as you well know, Scott Milne was raised in this community. He brings very values to this campaign. He's from a good family, he's smart, he's experienced, he works hard. He's been in the real world, building a business through the ups and downs, helping Vermonters face the hurdle of job creation and affordability will come naturally to him because that's what he's been doing throughout his professional life. He's the kind of leader we need to confront our stagnant economy, put Vermont back on track to create more jobs and provide relief to working families. He's from outside the bubble. He's unaffected by the stale air of the State House. He understands the struggles of the average Vermonter because he's confronted them himself. Most importantly, I really think we need balance in state government. To be perfectly honest, it wasn't really good for the state to have my party controlling every office for over a century. And it's not good when the other party controls all the offices either. I think the best ideas are crafted when officials from all sides come together to find common ground. I know that Scott will restore that balance as we confront the challenges that Vermonters are facing today. He's smart, he's experienced, he's ready to roll up his sleeves Friends and fellow Vermonters, the next governor of the great state of Vermont, Scott Mill. Thank you very much, Governor Douglas. I was uh, remembering 30 something years ago when I worked for a uh, aspiring politician named Stuart Ledbetter uh, that he would uh, pull out his reading glasses when he was speaking once in a while and I think as a 22 year old I think he was pretty old. Um, one of the benefits I have today is large font. <laughs> so we'll see how this rolls but if I pull out my glasses Stuart I'll be thinking of your dad when I do it. Um, before I uh, launch into a couple of prepared remarks I'll just say uh, I parked about 300 yards from here across the street from the house that my grandparents lived in for 60 years, 70 years, where my dad grew up. I remember spending a lot of time there as a kid and walking over here and enjoying uh, this library. And um, you know, in the, in the 1940s in Barrie, you could walk up and down Main Street in your conversations in five languages. It truly was a melting pot of everything that was good about America, and I think everything that can be good about America as we go forward. Um, and uh, Barry's, like a lot of towns, has had a little bit of tough luck over the last uh, a few years. And uh, I think uh, as Governor Douglas very uh, happens to agree with me on most issues, uh, there's an opportunity to change that. And uh, um, I'll talk a little bit about how I think we can do that. Um, <coughs> First of all, I want to thank everybody for being here today, and I hope you'll get a chance to stop by uh, right behind us and enjoy uh, the burger and spend some time with my family and meet some of my friends, and I'll learn, learn a little bit more about, about, more about me and how I got here. Also, I got a great staff uh, that I'm hoping you'll be able to have the opportunity to say hello to and, and offer your advice. But I want to thank you for coming today as we launched the 2014 campaign for Vermont governor. It's appropriate to me that it officially starts here at the Aldrich, a place that's been a, a, a great resource for um, many hours uh, for people in my family and patrons. Uh, it's been a great part of Barrie and a great part of Central Vermont. 
Uh, I don't want to be self-serving with this, but I would argue that a library is a travel agency of sorts. It gives, gives people uh, uh, the opportunity, if you're adventurous and curious enough to experience other places and points of view, it enables people to broaden their understanding of our world. It also enables people to sharpen our tolerance, our knowledge, our respect for others, even when we have different points of view. Um, and as we all know, I'm here today because I'm announcing that I'm a candidate for governor of Vermont. You may have heard that we're running a little bit of a contrarian campaign, and we're going to stick to that. Uh, I promise to run a campaign of ideas. I promise to provide the voters of Vermont with an alternative to the present administration, which has failed by steering the ship of state into uncharted waters, making promises it cannot fulfill, and I would argue ignoring the basic needs of Vermonters. I will. As part of this campaign, however, we will not be vilifying the governor. We will not stoop to attacks on his character. But that doesn't mean that we don't intend to question whether the course he has set for the state is responsible and realistic. Whether the long-term health of our economy, and most importantly of our people, is best served by continuing the ultra-progressive agenda and government that he has created as his legacy. I'm a moderate Republican, and I come from a long line of them. <coughs> Although another party has dominated the elections of recent years, I believe most Vermonters are like me. We share a common set of values that are more tempered for exuberance and rapid radical change. I believe Vermonters respect tradition. For the most part, we practice cautious, understated optimism. Our government should not take unnecessary risks, particularly when it comes to spending money we don't have, raising taxes we can't afford, creating programs that have no proven likelihood of success. And if you agree with me, we want to end this era of unbridled experimentation with our government. I have no interest in stunts and slogans and promises that have no point other than to glorify or humiliate any given candidate. That will not be part of what we'll be doing over the next 100 plus days. I come from the world of business, where flashiness and boasting can maybe win for a day or a week, but in my experience, never in the long run. Bullying tactics are not respected where I come from. Leadership is defined by trust, not brazen displays of power. Um, God willing, I'll have the opportunity to demonstrate that uh, you can believe that's what will happen when I'm elected. The business world needs and respects government, but it is wary of too much government. Wary that an expanding government is by its nature inefficient and an obstacle to the entrepreneurialism and industry that we need in Vermont. I start this race, um, seems like every time there's a conversation it involves bank accounts and uh, war chests with me on the losing end. Thank you for uh, reiterating that, Governor Douglas. I, I think that is going to be one of our assets as we move forward. I start this race fully appreciating the slope of the hill that we have to climb. Incumbency is in itself a powerful advantage, as is a huge bank account. I could have stayed out of the campaign for governor. I love Vermont, and I want to see people succeed. For that reason, I'm compelled to challenge the, incumb the incumbent and his agenda. He must answer for his unkept promises and his mistakes. The bubble of his rhetoric must be deflated and seen for what it is. I suggest we wipe away the foam and see what's left. With a new governor, with more balance in our capital, and with a more moderate course, we can do better. I believe that Vermonters agree with me. 
that it would not be right for Vermont to have a governor freely take another term without having to answer for his misjudgments or fail to justify his actions. Every public office must be earned at the ballot box. In the weeks leading up to November 4th, in, debate, in debates and answers to questions from the people, this administration must answer for its shortcomings and its overreachings. We will give Vermont a serious debate. We have already seen this governor and this administration win elections simply by promising to do the hard work that's required after this election. It's time for a new governor, it's time for new leadership, and for someone else to do the hard work that is necessary, openly and candidly, based on reality, not fiction. We must do better than this. I believe I will do better than this. This is my first campaign for statewide office. Another thing oft re, um, reported in the press as a weakness, I uh, believe it's one of my greatest strengths. It's not my first campaign. My grandfather, my father, my mother all served in the Vermont legislature. I grew up with discussions about politics and governors and the critical issues facing the state, not just at our dinner table, but in car rides around Vermont and in gardens and uh, sometimes on lawnmowers. <laughs> Without the power. Um, and um, I think uh, I was blessed, um, you know, uh, I always get in trouble when I deviate from scripts, but I will say one of my greatest blessings, which I think is a blessing that's enabled by Vermont, not just by me, but by everybody that uh, loves Vermont the way I do. You know, amongst my greatest friends in my life are my parents and my children. And uh, that uh, clearly is possible, but not as strong if you don't get to live in the same neck of the woods. Um, one of the big problems we have in Vermont going forward is kids having to leave state to find jobs. Uh, I ran into three people this morning at Central Market that are supporting me, but they moved to Florida because they can't vote here and can't pay taxes here. So there's a lot of work to be done to get us back on track. And um, as part of our discussions about politics, I think we also learned firsthand, not so much with spoken word, just by example, the power of uh, living a good life and uh, of public service. My mother, Marion Milne, started Milne Travel about uh, 39 years ago. Uh, and it had fundamental principles, the first of which is service. Um, she's lived her life guided by that idea in private life and in public life. Uh, I believe I'm cut from that same cloth. I hope uh, Vermonters have the opportunity to question whether or not that, that's true as we go forward. Uh, but uh, to quote Governor Shumlin, trust me. <laughs> um, that tradition honors practical governing principles. A sensibility of restrained government. A government that's careful when it comes to spending Vermonters' money. Reluctant to raise taxes. Respectful of local control. Supportive of creative solutions for Vermont's problems ideally that aren't run by the government. It is with these values that I launch my campaign today and with which I plan to manage the people's interests as governor in January. It's these values that made the state. It's these values that are missing from the incumbent's agenda. It's these values that should inspire us in the future. I pledge to you and to all Vermonters that I will take the office of governor responsibly and if elected, I will always listen to people before I act. I want to thank you for turning out today. I look forward to spending time with you as, as we progress through the, uh, the next hour or so. And uh, anybody that wants to reach out and support our campaign, uh, we're most welcome for that opportunity. Thank you, everybody.
Hi everybody, I'm Brent Burns, I'm uh, Scott Mellon's campaign manager, and we'd love to invite you all just uh, behind this building to the Elks Lodge for a burger. Uh, we'd love to have you. Thank you for coming out. We appreciate it. Pricing people out of state. The other thing that's also tied to the economy is this massive overhaul of uh, health care and how we're going to move forward with that in a way that's not reckless with people's money and uh, and um, is going to and, and not only with people's money but with people's confidence that we're going to have quality health care five, ten years down the road. Well, what is the path forward on health care? You've called yourself agnostic on, on the governor's path. What, what do you see as the path? Uh, what I've uh, said uh, and admitted uh, agnostic uh, probably wasn't the best word to use. Uh, very clearly I'm uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, thoughtful talking to people that know a lot about the issue. Uh, very critical of the choices the governor made to go it alone versus other ways he could have gone. But we're really going to talk about from here forward what we do. As we get into September we'll have very specific uh, ideas on what that is and how that is. Right now we're still in the process of learning more about people and making sure we've got our, our plan together. One of the um, questions I'll anticipate for you uh, is, uh, gosh, is it too late to get started? You're getting such a late start. Tom Salmon didn't even announce he was running for office in 1972 until August. I think Vermont was about as Republican in 1972 as, as it is Democrat now. Governor Salmon became governor by winning in that state with a late launch. I think a late launch is going to enable us to have momentum. It's going to enable us to do this on a shoestring budget. And uh, we're very confident about where we are and where we're going. What kind of economic uh, efforts do you see forthcoming? What can be done to stimulate the economy specifically? Um, uh, well, in general, having a uh, administration, and I think the Shumla administration has um, exacerbated this perception, which I, I would say is a reality, but it's inarguable that there's not a perception around the country that Vermont's not a good place to do business. That's gotten a lot worse under the Shulman administration's governing style uh, than it's been in the last 25 years in Vermont. That's going to change, and I think just having a Republican, moderate governor come into office is going to do wonders for changing that. So we'll start with that, then we'll work on sort of some of these things within the government, maybe that are more fundamental um, hindrances to uh, a good economy. But in general, um, we're going to move forward with the principles that I laid out in my announcement last week, making decisions based on practical versus political goals. Um, the more local a decision can be made, the better off it is. That clearly doesn't mean that every decision can be made locally. And we really need to have more of a business-like, common-sense approach to, to how we're deciding what we're going to do and then how we're going to do it, which I talked about today. Should Vermont uh, be consolidating school districts, closing some schools as a way to reduce educational costs? What Vermont should be doing is having a governor that's going to not be spending the whole session uh, flying around the country raising special interest money and um, you know, kind of doing some of these things that are good, whistleblower protection, maybe marijuana funding, um, you know, the GMO labeling bill could have been done a lot better, but in general it's, it's a good concept. The governor should have been rolling up his sh shirt sleeves and walking across the street to the Capitol and working with the uh, House leadership and the Senate leadership to get something on the table. I don't know what's going to be on the table, Dave, but what's going to be on the table is everything if, if I'm governor and I'm going over there and I promise people in the first half of the biennium that we will have a specific plan to fix what's going wrong. And it's going to be complicated. You mentioned marijuana. Do you favor legalization? or is that I, do, I think it would be a mistake to legalize marijuana now. I think, uh, you know, in, uh, in my business, one of the ways we've been successful, we have this saying, which, you know, isn't meant to be a slogan, but pioneers get slaughtered long before settlers actually plant corn. I don't see a need to be a pioneer in too many things in Vermont. I think that's one of the problems we have with our current administration. You know, we've got to be first to rush out to everything. You know, the GMO labeling law, to me, is another example of the way we did that. You know, Governor Shulman got a, you know, featured spot on the noon hour on national public radio for a nationwide audience over that, but Vermont's going to be stuck with a lawsuit and a bill that could have been, could have been done much more collaboratively and basically had the same impact. Um, 
energy policy is uh, an area also which is uh, quite a bit in flux. Do you agree with the state's goal of trying to get 90% from renewable energy by 2050? Do you think we're on the right track on energy or do you think changes need to happen? I think uh, it's another example of, uh, you know, uh, why are we leading with our chin? Um, you know, I think there's a lot more thought that should have gone into our energy policy. I think one of uh, George Aiken's great uh, legacies is standing up against paving the uh, long trail and turning it into a parkway like we have in West Virginia. Um, I think that showed a caution, temperament, and thought should have been part of the Shumlin administration. Some thoughts on energy policy before they move forward with carving up ridge lines in the Northeast Kingdom. It's something that uh, we'll be taking a careful look at, and we'll, we'll have a good comprehensive energy policy as we get closer. Was pushing Vermont Yankee to close in the state? It was uh, very clearly uh, uh, poorly managed. Uh, it was a it was a, a great uh, way to get elected. I think if you look at his election strategy, it's one of the things I've said to several people. You know, I reached out to Brian Doobie. I think on the uh, evening of the last election or the day after the last election, and and stole a quote a quote from uh, Bush one after he lost to Bill Clinton, which was essentially. You know, if he does half a good a job of running the state as he did of running this campaign, you know, I'll be I'll be comfortable with it. The challenge I have with the Shumlin administration is they continue to run the state like it is a campaign. Um, I think there could have been, uh, granted, he got elected running that way. I'm not going to run that kind of campaign, but he got elected that way. But we could have had a much more contrarian, collaborative approach with Vermont Yankee. I'm not an expert on it, but I think what we're going to be stuck with now is a uh, nuclear slum down there on the banks of the Connecticut River for 65 years or whatever the maximum decommissioning time is with a more thoughtful, business-friendly governor and a more thoughtful, business-friendly administration. I would say that probably could have been avoided. I wasn't there. I don't know, but I don't think I've read any there, anywhere that that was one of the tools they had in their tool chest to try to solve that issue. I didn't say uh, single payer is a bad idea yet, and I said uh, single payer is uh, way out in front of itself and too radical and, and not a conservative enough approach towards how we could have gotten there. Um, I think one of the uh, challenges with politics clearly in Washington, D.C. and in Vermont is that, you know, people think the way you lead is by running a poll, figuring out what people want to hear, you know, pretend you're jumping in front of the parade so that you can pretend you're leading them around. I think leadership is um, surrounding yourself with smart people, having good management skills and deciding what is best. I think my mom is a uh, tremendous example of that with civil unions. If she was uh, running her uh, legislative district based on polls, I think you could make a reasonable argument that civil unions perhaps would not have become law in Vermont. So that to me is an inspirational model of what good government is all about. People deciding where to lead people, not just pretending they're leading and where they want to be following. A lot of people see civil unions as a prime example of Vermont being on sort of the leading radical edge of change in the country. Uh, you sound like somebody who's very cautious about getting Vermont in that position. How do you square that? Um, because it's not a, a money issue that we're going to go broke over. I think there's two opportunities in, the, in my lifetime where we saw a need for uh, radical um, change in the state. One was with uh, Dean Davis and Act 250. It clearly needed to be done. The state was going to be in trouble if there wasn't sort of you know, controversial legislation like that put through. I don't know what the polls were in 1970, but my sense is that might have been similar to your question, and I think a lot of people thought we were reticent. I think when you saw later in the 70s, where statewide zoning tried to get through the legislature and it was voted down a few times. So, so my sense is Dean Davis was my example of a good leader. Saw an opportunity to fix a problem, even if he didn't have the support of the people, he risked his political capital to get it done. The second uh, opportunity, I think, for that, it was, you know, the catalyst was, as you know, the Supreme Court decision, but I think it was an important um, opportunity for people to go against what Paul said to do what's right. You mentioned that you might not have specifics until September. Primary is September August. Are you taking this for He'll be talking about our principles and priorities, but um, you know, I think uh, the bigger question is why has Governor Shumlin been there for six years um, touting single payer and he still can't tell us how much it's going to cost or what it's going to look like. I think it's completely unreasonable for me to be on the defensive right now for not having answers that he has six years.
years and uh, over $100 million of uh, money spent on him and, and he can't, still can't answer. So we're going to spend the next month challenging the Shumlin administration to come clean on some of its mistakes and let us know how things are going to be different going forward. Because if things are going to be the same going forward with the Shumlin administration as they have been in the past, I'm going to win this election pretty easily. But how do, um you're the man, thank you. <laughs> How do Republican voters then decide whether you're the one that if they if they're not sure what your specific is? I've been pretty specific. I think I've been pretty specific, Terry. I'm not coming up with specific legislative uh, proposals that we're going to be floating by uh, voters in, in August. And we'll be coming up with more specific plans as we get towards September. But, you know, we basically got a 110-day election march here, and uh, we're going to stick to our plan, which is uh, the governor says he's not doing anything, although I think everybody realizes that's not really what's going on. Uh, but the election's going to be about... Um, creating um, what I think are very reasonable doubts in voters' minds about what the Shumlin administration has been doing and that so far this campaign of trust us we're going to get tough things done next time is what we've heard two times before and I think it's too late to be off for that again and I believe if we're if I'm credible and if we're able to get people to listen to us that's going to be a very powerful message. Do you support that? No. 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 I think it's some they're all waiting for us next door. Okay, yeah. we'll head over. I, I, I'm, I'm very supportive of the concept of Act 250. I think it's another example of uh, the Shulman administration hijacking something and turning it into a political ideology rather than a practical program that needs to be um, uh, applied uh, more pragmatically. So Act 250 has been a great part of the mom, as I said to Dave, it's something that I uh, was supportive of as a 10-year-old or 11-year-old when it was brought about. And, you know, I think it's evolved and I think it's a good example of, you know, our tradition in Vermont is to take what we have and, and fix it. You know, Act 250 came in as a radical program, but it's been kind of built on since then. I think that's the way we should go forward. I think as we look at school districts and things, as we look at healthcare, we're stuck with some of these things. We've got to look on how to build them and move forward, not just throw them aside. How specifically has the hijacked? Um, I think if you uh, look uh, between the uh, poor management at the agency of Commerce over the last uh, four years, uh, very poor management at the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, there's uh, very uh, evidential answers right there. We're gonna we're gonna roll next door, guys. Come on over. Skip you. Does Governor Douglas campaign? Uh, I sure hope so. I think he's. I think he. No, I think. I, 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 well, let me let me retract that in. I think there's uh, a tradition of uh, incumbent. Uh, well, maybe there's a few aberrations on it in the past, but not getting too involved in uh, challenging their successor. And uh, I respect Governor Douglas. He came out today. Uh, this is a big part of our campaign, but. He's good for me for advice, but he's not going to be following me around on the campaign trail at all. Unless you can talk him into it. <laughs>